to the severity of COVID transmission in the area. And so uh, areas that are considered severe in terms of COVID uh, transmission will be protected under an eviction moratorium until October 3rd. Uh, that uh, covers over 94% of Oregon. Um, only Lake County currently is under the low transmission designation in Oregon and therefore the rest of the state I believe is currently covered. As you know, there was an amendment to Senate Bill 278. It's called the Safe Harbor Amendment, which uh, essentially allows tenants who are unable to pay their July or August rent to be covered under a 60-day eviction moratorium only if they can provide proof to their landlord that they've applied for rental assistance through Oregon Housing and community services. Um, lastly, as we know, only 6.5% of rent assistance has been distributed nationally. So the majority of those funds uh, remain untouched and it is not getting to our people fast enough. And so we know that we need an additional solution, uh, a real solution so that we can secure uh, you know, a far, far stronger uh, eviction moratorium. And I will pass it to you, Kim. Thank you, Esperanza. Um, and just to let everybody know, um, we figured out the, the live streaming, so that will be happening soon. And um, great timing because um, 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 I'm sorry, um, we have, um, we're first going to be starting with one of our leaders, um, Amber, is going to be telling us something about what her experience as a tenant um, and those of, around us, and also um, make an introduction and, and welcome for Senator Dama. Um, and I know that there are comments and questions, um, and there will be um, time um, for that. Um, soon here in the agenda, and we really um, appreciate um, um, all of your your um, attention and um, and what you have to offer. So um, go ahead, Amber, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Kim. Hi, my name's Amber. I'm an artist, um, a seasonal tax preparer, and um, a tenant organizer living in low income housing. Um, my long-term relationship ended while I was learning to write fiction. Um, just as rents shot up and uh, the job market decided it didn't want to hire anybody without um, recent work history, um, paired with a physical disability that doesn't allow me to do the easy entry jobs on your feet, it took me over three years to get back on my feet. After 15 years of my landlord praising me to the sky as the most wonderful tenant he never wanted to lose. You know, the very first month I couldn't pay rent, um, he evicted me and um, launched me into what was an odyssey of abuse as a pauper renter in other people's homes. Um, I finally went into a shelter because it was the only way I could get funds to get me into a place of my own with, you know, first and last month's rent and deposits and all that covered so that I could actually afford the monthly rents. So the, the sheer insanity of the fact that you have to become homeless in order to get assistance, there's no reason for people to have to face, you know, a nightmare of traumas requiring years of recovery when housing is a basic human right. And we can legislate it to be that way. <clears throat> There's no inherent reason why the already wealthy should be allowed to make a ton of unearned income from property ownership. It's only that way because we let them. 40%, maybe 37, but something like that of us Oregonians are renters. We're paying high monthly rents into the economy every single month, making us an incredibly strong and vital part of the economy who deserve housing safety. So I wanna to say today, we're pleased to welcome our Oregon Senator, Casey Jama, back to Cats Cancel the Rent Call. 
as well as hashtag Team Casey Jama member Kian Truong. And I, you know, I want to share that in his first seven months in office, Senator Jama has already been <laughs> at the forefront of strong changes made for BIPOC, refugee, and homeless residents. I encourage you to learn more about him and sign up for his e-newsletter. You'll be inspired. Senator, as the chair of the Senate Committee on Housing and Development, uh, we'd, we'd like to know if you're committed to reestablishing an eviction moratorium to keep these 125,000 Oregon, Oregonians who are at risk through no fault of their own um, in this pandemic in their house. We've been calling for real measures like cancel the rent to keep people safe in house since the pandemic started and really hope to find a champion to sponsor a bill to that effect in January. We have an Oregon Senate controlled by the Democrats. So we, we wonder why we couldn't find anyone and why they wouldn't pass a better eviction moratorium for longer on their own. Without it, renters have been living in constant unsettling fear, you know, as these short term stopgap measures, um, they're kind of been barely approved at the last minute, covering less for less people each time, you know, when this is a huge ongoing issue that needs brave new solutions. Um, we know rental assistance will never be enough. The SB 278 unfortunately won't cover renters long enough for the rental assistance to be issued, that the economy isn't gonna recover soon enough, that pandemic federal UI, right? Un unemployment insurance at expiring next month and without it, all those people on unemployment, they won't be able to afford rent. Um, that the Delta variant is quickly escalating, taking us you know, backwards and not forwards. Um, more is needed where all will suffer, right? Mass evictions will harm everyone with a vast state assistance needed for the homeless for decades to come. <laughs> that means, you know, way higher taxes for all of us, unlivable higher crime, loss of workforce, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not a renter issue. It's a health and prosperity of the entire state issue. With, of course, <laughs> the worst impact on marginalized Oregonians just across the board on that. Um, so if, if so, if you, <laughs> I'm going to pass it over to you in just a sec. But if you'd let us know, you know, what you're currently working on, um, you know, to really and securely protect us all from this crisis. I know you've been working really hard, and we'd love to know, you know, what your your current steps are and thoughts are, um, and you know, if you can help us understand a little better what the challenges are in the state legislature, um, what's possible during the special session and the regular session in September so that we and Kat can be an effective part of the solution. So thank you and I'm gonna pass it over to you, Senator Jama. Thank you, Amber, for your uh, warm introduction and good, good afternoon all the CAD members and community members who are here today. I am just really grateful that I am with you today because I think, Amber, you're absolutely right. I think this is really, we're dealing with some, you know, a crisis. Uh, both, you know, short-term and long-term issues around housing, as you know. Uh, you know, as a former refugee uh, and someone who came from a grassroots organizing, I understand the challenges that our community are facing. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's issues that I have partnered with CAD for many years when I was the executive director of United Oregon, and I'm committed to continue to partnering uh, with CAD. Um, as a senator, uh, as long as I am there, as I'm working side by side with, with you all to ensure that we have uh, transparency as we have, and we have actually um, housing needs to be addressed in state in our state. Uh, having said that, um, I also want to I'm sure you know that this, but I want to acknowledge that CAD's contribution in last session, uh, 2021 uh, uh, long long session. Without CAD's partners and with you all being um, pushing us and working side by side, both 282 and 278, and among many other other housing bills that we boosted, we wouldn't have done the work that we have done uh, without CAD's ongoing advocacy and being holding accountable uh, uh, to all uh, for, uh, all of us, including myself. 
So I'm just really grateful the work that you all have done and you continue to do you know, for our community on behalf of the planters, but also on behalf of the all Oregonians. Um, with that said, you know, I think there's a couple of questions that you ask Amber that I just really want to address. Um, I think probably uh, you already addressed the issues around what we have done this session, but I'm going to highlight a couple of things that have already been mentioned. We actually have done uh, 282, which is really the bill that uh, created a grace period uh, for uh, until February, folks who are owning rent, own rent, uh, back rent to make sure that they have time enough time to process and get access to resources to pay their rent and also will um, seal the credit uh, history that relate to the, if someone has been affected by their landlord because of unpaid rent. Um, and we collaborated with CAD and CAD has been on our side by side working with us. Um, we also have done the last bit effort to ensure that the 278 bill uh, passed. And I think uh, your earlier presenter really highlighted very well what that bill does and um, uh, ensuring that at least people who are applying, uh, apply their rent assistance, they're able to have at least 60 days uh, 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 to not be affected uh, while they're waiting their rent to be paid. Uh, and so we worked out with that said, and actually this wouldn't have happened without the collaboration of our my co colleague at the house side, uh, uh, Chair Fehi, who's really also been a very, very much partner and a strong supporter protecting the renters. And uh, so we work side by side, both her and I, and with them among other, uh, other leaders to ensure that we do our best to ensure that our renters are protected. Um, I think also overall, in addition to that, I think, we have done overall additional work around housing. You know, as you all know, that this is not a crisis that began with COVID-19. We were already uh, dealing with crisis, and CAD has been forefront also this issue. So I'm not going to uh, repeat something that you already know. But we already had a crisis, and just uh, um, what COVID-19 did to us, it was just really highlighted the disparities that existed in our community, uh, both uh, uh, economically, socially, and and so. Um, we know this is going to be ongoing, but we also have to ensure that we have to think about long-term strategy while we are addressing this crisis. Uh, so in addition to the uh, SB 278 and HB 278, and as well as the SB 282, we also did the uh, Senate Bill 291, which makes more difficult to screen out applicants who had a prior criminal history uh, uh, and, and uh, also convictions. Uh, there are so many other bills that we have done. We also passed the SB 79, which really allows, helps people to have a home ownership uh, program, which, goal, which is the goal to reduce the disparities in our, our home ownership, uh, focusing that issue. I think we have done a lot, but I think there's a question that you asked me that I really would like to hear from the folks who are here before I respond to it, which is, you know, you really said it. We have a democratic majority um, in our Senate and in the House, but yet we're unable to pass uh, a fiction moratorium. So I actually would like to hear before I respond to that question, I would like to hear from uh, community members who are here. What do you think is the issue? Why cannot we pass moratorium while we have the majority? And I'd like to hear a few people's perspective before I answer that question. I'll stop there. Um, I, I see um, Bora's hand is up and um, just let everybody know Iyande will be um, and Koya will be managing the, the questions. And I'm genuinely interested really to hear from you because I think really it's a good question to be where should be asking ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thank you so much, Senator Jama, for citing interest and taking interest in hearing from these members. Um, Ms. Deborah Olson, I see that your hand is up. Please proceed with any questions that you may have for the Senator. Okay, good afternoon, Senator Jama. Um, I, I think some of the fear that this isn't getting passed is because some of the elected officials uh, believe they won't get reelected again. Um, it's for, about 40% of Oregonians are renters, but 
the so that doesn't make 60% landlords. A lot of people are homeowners and are not landlords. And I don't know what that ratio is, but I want to bring up, um, I've done a lot of different jo volunteer jobs at CAT. And one I did was data entry. And when I was, was doing data entry, I remember the first one of the first rent increases, uh, substantial rent increases was an elderly retired gentleman his rent went from 7770 to 1500 they doubled his rent and he just lived on the west side of thir southeast 39th and that used to be a lazy way for a landlord to evict somebody was just raise the rent high enough where a tenant couldn't afford it and i can't tell you what year it was but it was before 2017 when nothing was done to help renters and when we declared a emergency state of uh, rent, renters emergency state and uh and slowly and that was renter zero and slowly a few more started tri trickling in four or five hundred dollar rent increases double the rent increases and I think that was the landlords unions and the landlords doing testing the water, how they can double the rents to get away with it. How come the Salem legislator can't just roll back the rents 50%? I mean, our income isn't that high to pay the rent now and there you'd need two incomes to pay the rent. And I can't tell you the name of that gentleman, but I did the data entry for a couple of times a week for several years at CAT. But I do remember that was the first one that I thought, wow, you know, I couldn't afford a rent increase. The, the, the gentleman had to move. You know, and now we have more seniors have forced to work because the rents are too high. I'm done. Thank, thank you, Deborah. I will answer your, respond to your question. But is there anyone else wants to respond to the first question that I asked? Why do you think we were not able to pass a moratorium? Because although we have majority Democrats, um, Delfina, please proceed. Yes, and I am to thank for this here. Uh, adelante, Delfina. So Delfina wants uh, to say that she is uh, incredibly thankful for your work on behalf of us, says Delfina. I am just uh, uh, a lady from the community. And many years ago, I did support with some volunteer work uh, when it was CIO. As a matter of fact, quien fue líder del Capitolio? So, so I just want to say that uh, I have many, many fond memories of work uh, in the community. And I do want to share that I am one of those affected by, uh, by, the, uh, by, by these uh, issues. I am being evicted from my home. I received a notice a notice of eviction. They were giving me only 30 days. And fortunately, uh, we were able to prolong it for 90 days. I 
And, and for the last two months, it's been so hard. I filled out so many applications, everything, apartments, homes, everything. But I don't know, and the rents are sky high. And I don't know if it's because of my nationality, but I get turned down almost immediately. And I am so thankful to Kat. Since I had been volunteering here, I've learned so much about my rights but also in uh, how to do outreach so others get to know about the rental rights as well. And despite it all, and despite the help, and despite the information that I'm privy to, I'm still facing a lot of obstacles. I only have 30 days for me to be to to for having to uh, vacate the house where I'm living, but I have not been able to secure a place to go to, and it's a dilemma. See. And, and one of the, the issues that we're considering, because we're a large family, there's seven of us. So we're thinking, you know, if, if it must be, then maybe we need, what we need to do is to split our family so that we have two different rentals, you know, because we have to do something we cannot foresee being thrown into the streets. And I and although I have family here, uh, they're already doubling up. You know, it would be unconscionable to have three families living under the same roof. When these are apartments of, you know, three bedroom apartments, maybe two bedroom apartments, you know, that's impossible. But the situation is not unique. You see it everywhere. And that is affecting us. It's affecting us physically, morally, spiritually. You get depressed, you get overwhelmed, you know, it's not just us, you know, it's the whole family that is facing this uncertainty. And, and I don't know how to ask you, you as our voice, you because you are in the, you have the possibility of advocating for us so that the rentals are more affordable so that we can really have access to being able to pay for the rents so that they're not so high and so that we can have a stable housing for so many of us. And I, I'm asking you and begging you to uh, to know that the situation is occurring is occurring uh, in great numbers, you know, in our communities, in the Latinx community, in the African American community, in the Afro Latinx community. It's happening all around, 
And I beg you uh, to please uh, see that these are difficult conditions for all of us and our families. And we would appreciate your advocacy. See, Delfina. And I, I want to thank you so very much for spending your Saturday here with us and for listening to us, you know, in our dilemmas. And I am just, you know, I'm eternally thankful for your work. Thank, thank you, Delvina, and I remember you uh, as well. So I, thank you so all you have before our community. I appreciate uh, your hard work, uh, both with CAD and with United Oregon as well, and among the many other organizations that you work with. Uh, I'm going to interpret through the conference line to, to save time, uh, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would also just suggest that I know we don't want to talk about through your case issue here, but I'm really sorry that you're facing deportation, um, not deportation, uh, eviction. Uh, but I would like to also ask either CAD or my, be my staff here um, to work with you if there is a, if the issue is unpaid rent for that you've been evicted, I think we can address that through the, uh, there's a lawyers that are available through Oregon Law Center and I think CAD knows that as well. So either CAD staff or my staff member can connect with your resources uh, to ensure that um, uh, you stay where you are in terms of if, you, if that's your wish, uh, if the issue is unpaid rent and uh, so that we can assist you in that, make sure you connect to resources. Um, so please let's uh, stay connected here after the, uh, the Zoom call. Uh, and Kian, I think is here also, he can put his our contact information on the chat so we can go from there. Um, secondly, um, I think overall the issue is really what we've been doing for the last um, month since the session ended, both myself and Representative uh, Chair Fahey, and I really were being engaged in implementation of, of the policies that we, that we passed 282 and 278. We have been meeting meeting every other week, Oregon Housing Community Services to ensure the 25,000 people that who are right now in, in, in the system right now who are requesting this uh, Oregon Housing Community Services for, uh, for uh, uh, online application process to access resources. So we've been meeting with them just every other week to ensure that there's a, uh, the work is done, and uh, both uh, Fahey and I have really engaged. Uh, also, talking to Multnomah County, uh, we know that there's about also 9,000 Multnomah County applicants who are in the state system as well who are requesting the application uh, resources being different being paid. So we know that the people are for filing applications, and we know that the, the applications are very slow, as Cad knows that. Uh, we are trying our best as both of us as two chairs housing both house side and senate side to ensure that the people are get their checks are processed. Um, so we are advocating on that sense and we're also talking to the court system to ensure that they also know what's coming um, and make sure that we help them the community members to uh, avoid that they've been affected as long as they are accessing resources. So we're doing our best, both of us as two chairs as we can to ensure that the implementations of those policies are in place. Um, with that said, um, you know, I'm going to give a little bit about my own understanding why we think we can get them where we have under moratorium uh, since uh, at the last session. The reality is that you folks, you know that this is a really um, we have 18 independent Democrats elected officials who are in our, our, you know, right now in the Senate. And any policy, as you know, it takes 16 votes uh, to get out of the uh, Senate uh, floor uh, to go to the House. Or if we get the House bill to make sure that it becomes a law, we have to have 18, uh, 16 votes from the Senate side. So the reality is that these folks, each and every one of them, are in a different place understanding our issues. So without getting the 16 votes, uh, there's no way that we can push the policy forward. The second piece is that I want to highlight is that after the, we met last time and, and Kat asked us to put the moratorium eviction bill, uh, you know, we talked to both in the executive branch, we talked to the House side, we talked to the uh, Senate side. 
we just realized that we there is no way we will be able to pass the policy. Uh, so the timid light timeline we were facing, and as well as the energy that we 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 the small energy we have, we wanted to make sure whatever we can to protect the rent is something that we can pass both the House and the Senate. Uh, that's where we our effort we we we, fought, we push our efforts, um, both my Fehi and myself. What we knew at the moment when we started this conversation is that if we put forward a bill that relates to moratorium, it's a non-starter, uh, both the House and the Senate. Uh, that's just really, there is just no political viability to push this bill forward. And that's why we push our efforts to focus on 282 and 278. Um, that's what we, where we can. This is a long-term process and it will take really both the Senate, the political shift in our state to ensure to align the values that we will uh, hold dearly. And so the reality is that unless we, this is going to be ongoing struggle. So unless we're able to get to the right structures and right voting as uh, having 16 votes better, the Senate side, what I can only talk about the Senate side of it, uh, unless we have able to push that any policy, uh, we just have to continuously both struggling and making sure that whatever we can to protect the, the community members uh, who are facing eviction. That's where we are. Uh, and to your question about whether we can introduce another bill that protecting the moratorium, when we were talking to the, both the landlord and the uh, tenants' rights advocacy advocates, I told them I will not rule out anything. Uh, as long as there's a political viability, as long as we were able to think we can push through the, both of the House and the Senate, I'm not going to be ruling out anything. And as, as, as we speak right now, I'm not going to be ruling out anything. It's just, we just have to wait until we cross that bridge. Iande, do we have more questions? I think Ernie. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, Ernie, please present your question. Hello, are you, uh, are you speaking to Ernie? Yes, please go, Ernie. Hi, yes. Uh, first of all, Senator, thank you so much for being with us today and for all your hard work. Um, I think you asked a question earlier about why um, do we think that you weren't, your efforts weren't successful to pass the, the recent legislation. And I would say that I think we have to look back to um, as far back as the 2017 session when uh, with House Bill 2001, when Senator Courtney would not bring the bill to the to the floor, they wouldn't even discuss it. Um, and then, if you look at the 2019 session, um, when you know the legislature was a little bit more proactive, when uh, Rep. Uh, uh, Speaker Kotek, excuse me, um, and others kind of you know took took that ball and and moved it forward, it's kind of an Overton window, so to speak, situation where. You know uh, um, the, uh, how much, uh, or what, or whether or not the legislature has the stomach to address those issues. So it seems like they didn't have the stomach to address it in 2017. In new in 2019, they were proactive about it. So I think really the question is is really a question of um, you know kind of counting heads and see seeing where your resistance is coming from to this legislation and and kind of figuring out you know those people that are resisting. You know what do they have at stake? What is it that they're? What's the reason that they're resisting? And then the obvious, you know, answer is, is lobbying, putting pressure on those people, you know, to uh, to kind of you know jump on the on the wagon here and get this done. Ernie, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's just you just highlighted. I think as I said earlier, of course, you know. Um, what I said earlier, which is, you know, if I if if I know there is a that is a bill that I can push uh, out of my committee, and we have the votes, of course, that's the first place, as you know, that the process starts. Um, and uh, if we know that the bill, then we can move out of the committee and we can send it to the full floor. Then that becomes becomes you know, we have the sixteen votes uh, to ensure that the bill goes out of the Senate uh, floor. Um, if we don't have it. It's just that's just reality. That's where the bill stuck, and that's why the bills a lot of times sometimes bills die. Uh, so we have to master how do we make sure that whatever we put forward that 
we are working together and we are pushing those folks who are, are in those positions of power, particularly those who are elected officials, including myself, uh, to ensure that you know we get the 16 votes right, uh, got done. Um, and again, this will be both Democrats and Republicans. I don't think so. This issue is just but one that can be labeled as just a democratic issue. I think we can, we can, we can have, we have to hold accountable the entire 30 senators who are on, on the system. That's where the accountability really should be focused, and not the only you know 16 or votes that we need or the 18 votes that we the Democrats had in the Senate, but. Uh, it's, it's a journey and it really, really becomes that we have to really work together to ensure that uh, we fight against the, you know, um, uh, uh, the narrative around that it's just the Democrats. If we have the votes of the Democrats, we should, we should be able to pass on a bill because we have the Democratic majority vote. That's just not the reality and that's not the case. And you, I think Andy, you said that well, and I think that's the case. So we have to really ensure that if we're introducing a bill, one, we want to make sure that we have the votes to pull out, push, beat those bills out of the out of the committee and the Senate floor. If we don't, then the question will be, where do we spend our energy? Thank you. Is there, a, is there is no additional question is what I will actually conclude is that I will really, really encourage to us to continue this conversation. Um, I will really encourage us, all of us to show up and um, meet those senators, all of them, 30 senators individually. I know CAD does a lot of lobbying and, and you know, taking the community members uh, to Salem and ensuring that the voice of the senators are heard. I will really continue to have that conversation. We have to really show up as much as we can uh, to in the building and and also online. As know that we know that now we're facing COVID nineteen. Um, but with that said, um, let's continue this conversation. And I, again, I cannot emphasize enough the need that we make sure that people are protected to stay their homes uh, and the importance of ensuring that the the people who are right now on the queue to apply for resources assistance that they get their uh, resources uh, and their rent, rent being paid through the both the system. I, I don't think people care about where the money comes from, whether it's the federal or whether it's the state or whether it's the uh, local uh, city or counties. People, all they care about, they want their rent to be paid. And we need to make sure that to, you know, continue to advocate on that and to ensure that the, the rent, uh, renters get their um, uh, rent, is, rent being paid. So I think, and also on top of that, continues to stay on, on 2022 uh, session and uh, work together and plan together what we can do collectively together. That's that's where I'm gonna end this conversation. I'm grateful the CAD is with us and I'm grateful that we are collaborating. And so uh, thank you all you do. And I'm looking forward to be working with you all uh, near future. And, and so thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Jama. Um, thank you. Just some yeah, um, and just to let you know, the second part of our conversation today, and, and you're welcome to stay if, if you can, is to really think about the next, um, the coming year, um, 2022. Um, and also, if you have a moment, we, we had a question about the special session, if there was any um, opportunities there this summer when, when you all are talking about redistricting. Um, so you know, if you if you have time to kind of give us a preview of what you think might be possible in 2022, um, if we're still in this situation with COVID, um, if if you know if, if we still have people um, with with back rent to be paid, um, we we're curious um, about that um, that will, to kind of launch us into this next conversation. Uh, thank you, Kim. Uh, I, I do believe, and this is really things can change quickly. As far as I know right now, the September meeting is really focused around redistricting. Uh, I think that's the only issue, unless things change, that's as far as what I know right now. Um, but, and I can actually honestly to be emphasizing enough to ensure that 
I hope you will all engage also to redistrict an issue because the equally important issues and 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 so that's uh, that's just my pitch to make sure that we all know that how important redistricting is and we all I think that's really uh, important another issue as well. Um, but to your question, I think mainly the conversation is going to end up on what we can do the short session and twenty two uh, session, and I think this conversation I would love to continue to work with and. Be continues to have a dialogue with CAD and other other also potential stakeholders. What's possible in 2022? Uh, of course, the, as the situation on the ground changes uh, rapidly and quickly, as we know right now, um, we'll just have to evaluate every step of the way where we are and what we can do. And I would love to invite and be part of CAD to be part of that conversation. And we'll we'll have that conversation as we continuously to assess the situation on the ground. Thank you. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, it's really difficult to predict. Um, and we definitely will be engaging you again. And we, um, we greatly appreciate um, your time today and being so proactive. Um, I want to give the floor to, to Donovan, who is going to lead us in this next conversation about um, future um, calls to action for this summer. Um, one of them being uh, the press conference that we have planned for August 19th. Um, so go ahead, Donovan, and um, thank you, Senator Drama. Hello, everybody, again. Uh, so we have a monthly event that we've been running through um, online because of the pandemic called Tenants on the Mic, where we've been you know, featuring renter stories like what we've heard here today, um, but highlighting one tenant, their story, and having them then do a performance. Um, so tenants on the mic, um, we wanted to bring it into an in-person uh, event this time and uh, fold it into a press conference to talk about uh, the state of housing right now. Um, and so we're going to really focus on that 125,000 um, people who will be potential or 125,000 households rather that will be potentially evicted here in the state, um, you know, and the fact that ORAP um, is, yeah, the ORAP money is not being spent um, in the right way and renters are continuing to be kind of left by the wayside right now. Um, so. Uh, that is going to be Thursday, August 19th, from 6 to 7 um, at the CAT headquarters um, over in the, what is it, Rose Park neighborhood. Um, so if you've not been to the CAT headquarters, this is a good chance to uh, engage with us and come through. Um, we're going to have uh, Musanda as our uh, lead performer, and uh, he's done some work with Community Alliance of Tenants in the past. Um, he's a seasoned musician and is really looking to, uh, you know, being a part of this thing with us. Um, so we'll have him speaking and we're, we'll have some other organizations joining us too. So we'll, we'll be making the official announcement out into the world, um, starting next week. Uh, there will be, you know, it'll be everywhere that you would expect. Thank you, Kim. Just drop the address there, uh, for cat, um, but yeah, we'll be uh, dropping it on our social media, on our website, and we'll have a Facebook event page. So, you know, be on the lookout for the e-blast on that. And, uh, you know, just share it, please. Share, share, share. Um, and uh, encourage people to come out with us. Um, so we have that coming. And then, uh, well, one, if is there any questions about that? I don't want to just bulldoze through the agenda. Okay. If there, uh, will this meeting be on the CAT website too or somewhere else? Uh, the press conference, we're going to stream it um, through um, our social media platforms on Facebook and Instagram. So uh, people will be able to tune in virtually if they want to as well. 
Um, I, I do want to note, like I said, Tennis on the Mic has been virtual as an event. It got created because we were in COVID. Um, and, you know, I know things have loosened up, but we still are in COVID, you know, so understand that people can, if not everybody's going to feel comfortable gathering with people right now, but we are going to take uh, precautions. We're going to encourage people to wear their masks um, and, you know, wash your hands and just stay safe uh, while they're out there. Um, but yes, it will be. Oh, this meeting. Uh, yeah, this meeting is right now is being streamed from the CAT Facebook. Um, we are also recording this meeting right now, so it'll be available um, on our YouTube and it'll also be available on our um, website um, sometime next week um, after this. And it, it'll, after this live stream, it'll still just permanently be on the page as well. Um, and then in terms of other ca call to actions, uh, you know, the, the eviction moratorium, like we've been saying, um, is, is something that we still need. We need to find pathways for an eviction moratorium. Um, you know, the, the ORAP system, like we've been hearing, uh, time and time again, it's not working. The state is, you know, uh, hiring some more people to get money out. I don't think we've mentioned this in this meeting, but like there's, they're hiring, I think 60 to 90 people, um, a surge employees to process what they hope to be about 8,000 applications. But nonetheless, that's not as many applications have even come in to the ORAP system. And um, it, it just comparatively, if we're talking about about 13,000 applications and 125,000 potential evictions, there's a gap, right? And there's a major gap. Um, and we're talking to people every day that don't know what their uh, protections even are. Um, so we need that moratorium to be in place so that we can you know, actually uh, get to folks and make sure that they are permanently uh, able to stay in their home. Um, you know, Even in these conversations about things like uh, the census and everything and conversations that lead to things like redistricting. I know there was a heavy push in this last iteration to talk about like hard to count populations. We know there are so many people being left out um, by, you know, by the systems. And so uh, the Biden uh, protections or the CDC protections, um, I know people uh, were really fighting for that. I know that there was some, uh, lawmakers in Congress that slept on the steps of Congress or the Capitol out there to, to force that issue. So that does protect some people, but it still isn't what we've been fighting for. Um, and so we, we can't like fall comfortable in like, like month by month uh, protections or uh, things that just kind of kick down the, the can. Um, so we are going to continue to, you know, pressure the governor, continue to call her down, continue to uh, send uh, messages to her office and uh, demand that the moratorium be extended. And, you know, even nationally, um, seeing what we can do, um, you know, to have conversations with our lawmakers that represent Oregon um, at the U.S. Uh, Senate side. Um, yeah, and just in general, fewer, fewer barriers to getting this rent assistance out. Um, you know, if any of y'all have signed up for the ORAP, uh, you probably have realized that it's, it's not an easy uh, just go in and uh, sign your name in situation. It's, it's something that's a little bit confusing. A lot of people are kind of left in purgatory too. Like you put your application in back in, May or June, and then you don't hear too much of anything for, for months. Um, these are the type of conversations we've been having with uh, OHCS as well. Uh, you know, like that this system is not working, whether it's the, the actual website itself or it's the, the system they're using to process these applications, um, or just generally the outreach that they're doing. And uh, OHCS is 
you know, been saying to us, this is a new process for them. Um, they've never distributed funds in that way, but we, we can't like fall comfortable in those, uh, those things either. Um, there are people on this call that are getting eviction notices right now. Um, and so we are going to continue pressuring um, to, for them to make this process easy for people because we know that a lot of the people who are signing up for rent assistance already have a ton on their plate. And as we've said before, like the, the pressures of this pandemic shouldn't be like, no, nobody is at fault for falling behind in this like global pandemic, especially with all the barriers of this year, um, you know, including the fires, including a year where we've been saying that we'll never go back to normal uh, while we were fighting for black liberation and things of that nature. Um, Amber said, yes, let's redo that application and make landlords have to give notice of the program before, uh, before issuing an eviction. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of people too who don't even you know, know about the protections that come with the, the letter um, and, and everything. So we, we need to make sure that all of these uh, protections are, are put in place for, for folks. And anybody from our team that wants to fill in any gaps, uh, please do. I, I just wanted to say, um, this is Kim, um, just as Amber pointed out, um, these I ideas about how to make the program better are really helpful. Um, at CAT, we're trying to pass this on to the state um, as, as they um, tinker with the program and try to try to make it better. Um, so, so this kind of feedback is, is really valuable. Um, continue to give it and we will um, do our best to, to pass it on. Um, I also just wanted to clarify as I did in the chat that in Oregon, um, your, the best way for a tenant to get protection is to utilize the protections under the safe harbor. Um, and that is to apply for rental assistance. And then if a landlord gives an eviction notice, to, you know, show them that you've applied and um, that gives that person um, 60 days. Um, and that's a big difference from the CDC order where an, a landlord can continue with the eviction regardless of whether or not you're um, applying for rental assistance. Um, all the CDC order does is stop the sheriff from locking you out. It does not stop the eviction, whereas Senate Bill 278 will stop the eviction and start the clock. Um, but the clock can't start on that eviction until after that 60 day safe harbor. So just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. And I, I would just say, you know, if any ideas that you all have uh, for how the application process can be made easier um, for um, renters, please email those to us here at CAT. Um, you can email me personally at donovans at oregoncat.org. Um, and it's D O V O. D -O Did I just spell my own name wrong? Sheesh, y'all gotta fire me. Uh, D O N O V A N S at OregonCat.org. Make sure you put the S though, because we have another Donovan whose name is spelled exactly the same. If you do Donovan at OregonCat.org, it will go to our finance department. So, um, yeah, Donovan S. Um, before we go on to our next agenda item, I just want to say that we will continue to have these conversations here at the Saturday meeting regarding our um, advocacy efforts. And um, so, yeah, so please keep be coming back um, to, to continue to participate in, in this effort. Um, I'm going to put our announcements in the chat, um, and then I'll also um, share the screen. Um, 
And then I also wanted to say that there's also opportunities, not only at the national level and state level, we also need to be thinking about what, what potential there is at the, at the county and at the city level as, as well. Um, many of these counties and cities have their own um, rental assistance um, that they receive from the federal government, um, and, um, and, and counties um, can take the opportunity to put in their own eviction moratoriums. Um, so I'm going to share the screen next. Donovan, go ahead if, if you want to um, have some other ideas before I get the screen up. Um, yeah, I don't have any particular things. I, I will say, um, you know, just, the, and this may seem intuitive for many of us, but I was in a conversation yesterday, um, you know, with um, some colleagues in another space and this public housing infrastructure is a public safety infrastructure. Um, and people are really just honing in on that that part. Like, if people don't have that basic need, I know we all know this, but um, you know the the violence that we're already seeing will be increased, and then we'll we'll fold into to very normal responses. So I'm I'm hoping that you know we can continue to to really uh, be laser beamed on. Uh, not not giving on fighting for this moratorium uh, together, but I see we got the announcements up, so I'll be quiet. Uh, before I um, give my announcements, are there any announcements from folks that are here? Uh, yes, uh, this is Deborah, and I have a, a one. Uh, uh, several of us have been, uh, Gresham community members have been meeting every Wednesday night. We've uh, changed changed that to just the fir first and third Wednesdays, and that may change again because uh, um, it makes no sense to have the meeting the day after the city of Gresham's meetings. So I'm hoping that uh, they change it to the second and fourth. But the community action that uh, Joe Joe started these meetings, and there are several other groups that join in. Uh, or as it stands, we're just meeting on the first and third Wednesdays now at uh, six o'clock at night. Oh, maybe it's five o'clock. Anyhow, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, um, it's one of those two times. I I apologize that I'm a little off kilter today. So, but. I can always uh, send that email to Kim. I think she does get it. So feel free to join us, Senator Jama, because <laughs> renters all over have have issues. And uh, being on the Gresham Housing Task Force and former Mayor Bemis, they were not helpful in protecting renters at all. But people, I mean, two or three years ago, there's no way I can buy a house on social security. So thinking that people should all become homeowners is kind of delusional, I think, if nothing else. I'm not gonna be able to buy a house on $800 a month social security. And I don't know anybody else who can. Um, I know there are people who get a lot more social security. Some of them can, the people who have GI bills, they can, I cannot. And if I didn't have a Section 8 voucher living in Tax 42 housing, I would not be able to afford to live here. Thank you. To Deborah's, Deborah's point, uh, please feel free to email us and invite us any place if it's that you might have. Uh, we'll try our best to make as many differences as we can. But of course, we know that time is limited. And, and I guess there is another problem with all these evictions. Uh, a lot of the uh, renters and tenants, they can't seem to get legal help. You know, legal, legal aid can only do so much. And if you're in any, in any kind of subsidized housing at all, uh, the, the hotline does refer you to legal aid. Uh, most attorneys won't, won't 
take on a subsidized housing case. And there aren't that many t attorneys that do landlord tenant to stuff in the, uh, anyhow. So I'm done. Thank you for that announcement, Deborah. Um, and if, if there are any other announcements, um, feel free to, to interrupt. Um, and in terms of um, uh, attorneys, um, I know that in Multnomah County, there's been an effort to increase um, counsel that's available. Um, I, I know that CAT feels strongly about right to counsel um, as, as a concept that be, should be funded and supported. Um, and it's, it's so true, um, you know, um, at CAT, we, we can't um, get enough um, referrals, but, but we definitely will, tr will try. It's definitely in need. Um, so at CAT, I, I wanna um, let everybody know that we are really very excited that we received a large grant from the state. And that grant means that we can carry out um, the, what members have asked for in our three-year strategic plan, and that is to expand statewide. So we have um, jobs um, on our website um, in Jackson County um, that include organizing and hotline um, work. Um, we're going to be doing more emergency rental assistance. Um, we have jobs in Marion County and Deschutes and the metro area. Um, not all of the jobs have been posted yet, but a significant number have, and we really um, value our members and the expertise that you bring from your own lived experience. So we highly encourage you to, to apply. Um, many people at CAT um, were volunteers first, and um, we, we really value that um, as, as part of, of being um, part of CAT. And um, it, with that new grant is also uh, some um, new volunteer opportunities. So in the past, um, we've offered stipends um, or ways, um, you know, small tokens of appreciation for all of the time and effort that you put into your work supporting CAT. And this year we're able to increase that um, significantly um, with uh, $5,000 stipends. We're hoping to have as many as 35 volunteers um, with intensive training so that there's more member to member support and more member to member um, advocacy throughout the state. So um, there'll be more about that soon and we encourage you to be a, a part of the development of that program. Um, August 14th, um, many of you may know that um, there's a new meeting that has been established. It's the member to member meeting. Um, so we'll be sending out notices about that. Um, and it's where members um, are really empowered and um, we're looking forward to what comes out of those meetings um, as CAT sets a new strategic direction because our current strategic plan is ending. And then August 18th, um, CAT is starting a strategic planning process. We're starting with our staff this week, and then we will be debriefing uh, Thursday afternoon on the 18th. Um, we'll be inviting members who have expressed interest to that meeting, and then that will be um, just a few days before we, incur we invite all of you um, to part of the, the initial, the kickoff meeting for our strategic plan that will be um, during our Saturday meeting, August 21st. So that will be a really important meeting for us and we hope you will join and bring others. Um, and I, um, as we said earlier, August 19th is our press conference at the CAT office in Portland. And August 20th, um, we'll be telling you more um, as we get more information about national efforts um, to, to demand um, from the federal government um, a national eviction moratorium that's stronger than what we've seen currently with the current CDC order. Um, are there any questions about the, these announcements? No, I just wanted to mention it's uh, East County uh, pro projects uh, that Joe is running. He's part of the uh, 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 East County Gresham Sunrise thing too. So he does a couple of different uh, hat things. And uh, as I said, it's still on Monday and Wednesdays. Thank you. It's good mm -hmm. to see you, Senator John. Um, and the Oregon Law Center um, wants to point out that there are more attorneys that have been hired this year. Um, and um, while 
in the past, it may have been difficult to get through and get legal aid assistance. Um, that is going to change greatly this year. And so they encourage you to call. And I, I put the phone number in the chat and, um, and I will do that again. And as we end um, today, if there's just any further thoughts um, or announcements, um, well, this would be the time. Good afternoon. I put a question in chat for you, Kim. Uh, thank you. I, I will look for that question. She asked, uh, do, do you train volunteers only at the Portland office? location. Thank you for that question. Um, right now, we anticipate that a lot of the training will ha be happening virtually um, because we do have members all over the state, but we, uh, but we do have an office in Jackson County. Um, we're planning to have an office in Deschutes and Marion County. So if there are opportunities and it makes sense in terms of the current um, public health conditions, we will try to do training in person as well. But right now it's virtual. And who should I contact if I am interested in working as a volunteer? You should call Gen Z and um, I will put Gen Z's, um, Gen Z right, is our member coordinator and manager for Community Alliance of Tenants um, and does a lot of things, um, but Gen Z will be the, the main point of contact for this program. Thank you very much. Absolutely. You can contact Gen Z at Gen Z at OregonCat.org, J-E-N-S-I at OregonCat.org. Um, and then I just also want to lift up the, the comment that Amber put in the chat um, for people who can't see it, um, that anyone needing legal tenant assistance can consider their situation on the Facebook group PDX Renters Unite, and often tenant lawyers will respond with clarifying questions or an offer for free consult. And then I also put in the chat the phone number for the Eviction Defense Project. The phone number is 888-585-9638. Or you can email evictiondefense at oregonlawcenter.org. <clears throat> Any more announcements or comments before we conclude? This um, <clears throat> meeting will be on our Facebook, um, so you can review it there. The notes, um, there's a lot of information that was shared today in the chat that will be available in the Saturday meeting notes. I, I really wanna thank everyone for all of your wonderful contributions. I wanna thank Senator Jama for taking time today. I um, also want to um, thank Alfina, our board secretary, um, for being here today and her very heartfelt comments. Um, and then um, and also a, a special thanks to, to Amber um, for helping to organize this meeting and prepare. Thank you, Marisa. Um, and um, as we announced last time, there is a strategic planning process um, taking place. Um, some, um, some of our members have volunteered to be a part of that and I'll be reaching out to you. Um, but if you're just hearing it just now, um, please reach out to me, 
and we would like to um, include you in that project. And have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. You too. Can have a